Okay. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Recipes for Change event. Um, we are starting a little bit early, so thank you for everyone who arrived a little bit early. Um, maybe we'll have some people trickling in during the event. Um, we, today, we're going to go on a little bit of journey to Jordan, first part, where EFAD is playing a pivotal role in helping farmers build sustainable livelihoods and businesses. But this event today isn't just about development. It's about how we convey these stories to the world. Recipes for Change is about communicating through something we all relate, we can all relate to, food. Through this relatable topic we highlight and thus talk about adapting to climate change, empowering women, youth, indigenous peoples, and addressing nutrition. Recipes for Change weaves these threads together because we cannot move forward without, we cannot move forward with one without the other. To grow sustainably, we must leave no one behind and we must consider the interconnectedness of these critical areas. During the sessions, if you have any questions, please for our panelists, just raise your hands and I'll call on you. You can stand up and just ask your question. Now let's turn our attention to our special guest, Chef Pierre Thiem, an integral part of IFAS Recipes for Change journey from projects in Senegal and Chad to being a voice at COP21 in Paris in 2015. Pierre Tam is a chef, author, and social activist, originally from Senegal and now based in New York. He brings West African flavors to the global platform. As an executive chef of Nok by Lara in Lagos, Nigeria, and the signature chef of the Pullman Hotel in Dakar, Senegal, he is cook for the King of Morocco, French President Emmanuel Macron, and former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. That's an amazing list of VIPs. <laughs> On the kitchen, Pierre is the co-owner and executive chef of Teranga, a fast food chain in New York City. His company, Yolo, Yolele Foods, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, and you'll correct me later, um, advocates for smallholder farmers in the Sahel, opening up new markets of crops grown in Africa. The signature product is Yolele Fonio. Pierre's latest cookbook, Simply West African, unlocks the region's essential flavors for everyday home cooks. So look it on, I'm assuming it's on Amazon. <laughs> His impactful TED Talk, given at TED Global 2017 in Arusha, Tanzania, has been viewed over 1 million times. So today's discussion promises to be enlightening, but also inspirational. Join me in extending a warm welcome to Chef Pierre Tiam. Welcome. We also have with us today Fudan Abdul Karim Ali Al Yarani, yes, um, dedicated program officer for EFAD, who works closely with the people you're going to see shortly in the film. Welcome, Fudan. So, and now we are going to premiere a brand new short film that we have developed, and we are bringing the field to COP28 today. Okay, let's see it together. Shortly. <laughs> there we go. Oh. In picking grapevine leaves, a popular ingredient for traditional dishes. But now, the effects of climate change are threatening this ancient custom. Abbiamo trovato dei, delle valli incredibilmente aride, che è l'effetto del cambiamento climatico. Jordan is used to a dry climate, but for farmers like Noor, who are unable to irrigate their crops, the unpredictable weather and the intense heat are taking their toll. على اثر ارتفاع درجات الحراره اللي حصلت السنه هاي طبعا هي اثرت على المحاصيل الزراعيه بالدرجه الاولى وبالذات العنب كونه انا صار في عندي جفاف كثير مثلا في بعض الاشجار مما ادى الى انه هاي الشجرات تم اتلافها allows her to harvest rainwater and irrigate her lands during the hottest months. L'energia solare e la raccolta dell'acqua e l'utilizzo della goccia d'acqua 
costante in modo da poter mantenere le piante e far crescere il territorio. Sono piccole azioni fondamentali per garantire la stabilità di queste famiglie. Mother of Four Law access the grant through the Rural Economic Growth and Employment Project funded by the International Fund for Agricultural Development or IFAD and the Government of Jordan. The project assists over 7,000 rural producers to increase their resilience to climate change through efficient water use and income generating activities such as food preservation techniques. تصنيع الغذائي من المشاريع المدعومة عندنا في المشروع أنا لما أطور أفكار زراعية حديثة عند المزارعين وأساليب زراعية حديثة عند المزارعين نعم بحمي مزروعات الفتاحي تصنيعي الغذائي وتوفير الغذاءات داخل الأردن وبالتالي عم بحافظ على موضوع الأمن الغذائي داخل الأردن We established a women's association to help members access grants and training She also opened a shop to showcase and market their produce along with a restaurant serving traditional local cuisine, which employs six women. Noor's business partner, Huda, struggled with beekeeping as increasing temperatures reduced her bee colony and honey production. To generate extra income, she attended a course on food preservation and received a grant to purchase a drill machine. Huda is also the restaurant's head chef. Using her grandmother's recipe, She teaches Chef Krakow how to prepare stuffed grapevine leaves, a time-consuming recipe that is available to the whole family in the only way for special occasions from the Middle East. A bit of pepper, a bit of salt, a bit of oil, and a bit of sugar. You mix it well with your hands and then you mix the leaves. The important thing that we have found here è stato proprio quello della conservazione delle tradizioni, tramandare le ricette, cercare di coltivare quegli ingredienti in modo che possano sempre essere trasformati poi nelle ricette locali. By upholding their traditions, no, and other women from the group have decent income and providing for their families. Grazie a questi piccoli finanziamenti, a questi progetti, questi territori ricominciano a rivivere, cominciano a, a rigenerarsi e a produrre dei prodotti fantastici che hanno un valore enorme. Over 1000 grants enable farmers like Noor to improve more efficient systems. This will allow them to continue growing traditional foods and enjoying local popular dishes for years to come. Molto buono. So that was, um, so we can give a round of applause. <laughs> that was Italian celebrity chef, um, Carlo Cracco. I don't know if any of you know him. He's quite famous in Italy. And he's another, uh, one of another incredible recipe for change chefs who shared his culinary talents with us in projects across Bhutan, Cambodia, Morocco, Sri Lanka, and now Jordan. The video was filmed at IFA's Rural Economic Growth and Employment Project, which is quite special because it's not just about statistics and strategies, which is important, but rather turns the focus to the people who are at the heart of it. It's all about making the life better for those who need it the most. It's about creating jobs and opportunities, ensuring that families can put food on the table and have a brighter future. It's about supporting the rural, poor, and vulnerable, particularly uh, our youth and our women. The project's mission is simple yet profound. It's about reducing poverty, ensuring security for the vulnerable, and promoting equality in rural areas. Thuden is here to tell us all about this initiative. Thuden, could you please tell us more about the Rural Economic Growth and Employment Project and how it focuses, focuses on the people and communities involved? Yes, thank you, uh, Rebecca. So uh, the Rural Economic Growth and Employment Project, or REGEP for short, actually started in 2016. The project was very successful that a second phase was approved with an additional EFAD financing of $15 uh, million dollars and a very generous grant from the Kingdom of the Netherlands of $5 million. This brought the 
the total project financing to $39 million in general. Like Rebecca said, the, the key objective is to create uh, productive employment opportunities for the most poor and vulnerable, focusing on women and youth. Now, before I go into the uh, various activities of the project, I'd like to put things in context a little bit. So in Jordan, 20% of the people rely on agriculture as part of their income uh, generating activities. However, 90% of the land is arid badia land, so it leaves very small space for, for cultivation, more or less. So the remaining 10%, only 10% of that is irrigated. It's irrigated for uh, cultivating the water intensive horticulture for export, which is not, not the best uh, approach. And you also need to know that the renewable um, water resources in Jordan stand at 61 cubic meters per year per person, which is so much lower than the 500 cubic meter absolute wat water scarcity definition by the UN. So they're really taking a problem there. And this problem is expected to grow because by 2040, the renewable water per person is going to be uh, 35 cubic meters per person per year. So logically, the project focuses on building resilience for water scarcity through a number of activities, and it uses a holistic value chain approach. First activity is technical capacity building to promote uh, low water footprint um, um, uh, crops, uh, such as, uh, you, of course, using drought resistant variety, varieties such as tomato, baby cucumber, okra, and, and aromatic plants such as thyme and, and uh, sage. It also gives the grants that were mentioned uh, there to, to uh, create new jobs for, uh, for the beneficiaries. It also promotes renewable energy, like uh, solar power and solar dryers, as a rehabilitation of uh, rainwater har harvesting plants. It offers continuous mentoring to the beneficiaries. It also offers access to finance through loans, so provided by uh, banks through a uh, partnership with the Central Bank of Jordan. Uh, these loans uh, give access to finance to both women and youth. Uh, we have not done the overall impact assessment, but the midterm impact assessment uh, indicated that 80% of Regip's beneficiaries experienced an increase in, in income, um, given an average revenue of 750 uh, Jordanian dinars, with a net profit of 365 Jordanian dinars, which is above the minimum wage of 260 Jordanian dinars. Back to you, Rebecca. Okay, thank you. That's a lot of information, but really good information to know. Um, you've given us quite a bit to think about, but can you share specific examples of how it has created jobs and opportunities and improved the lives of families, especially women and youth? Yes, uh, as we saw in the video, this uh, beneficiary is actually part of what we call an SCG, which is saving and credit group that the project promotes. Uh, usually the SCGs have between 10 and 15 uh, beneficiaries. So when it does it, it either gives group grants or individual grants. This beneficiary got an individual grant, mm -hmm. but she started her cultivation, she started the restaurant and she employed other women. Mm -hmm. Some of these women also got uh, group grants and they started their own businesses. Uh, last year alone, uh, I think 235 jobs were created through these S SCGs uh, for, for women groups specifically. Uh, we also have the, the uh, percentage of women overall SCG members, which is around 9,000 uh, people, like 61%. And the youth represent 43%. For the loan beneficiaries, 64% are women and 60% are youth. So the opportunities here are focusing on youth and women, giving them a chance to create new income generating activities. So that's amazing. So I was there in Jordan with Krakow, and I think oftentimes when we talk about a little bit of statistics and numbers, we think of individual people. And I think one of the great things about this project, and I'm sure a lot of EFAD projects, is that we actually create communities. And I think that's important to know. Like this is a community of women got together. It was created specifically to get grants and um, and project money so they could do the restaurant and do other activities. One of the beneficiaries actually got part of the restaurant. She no longer is relying 
relying on government funding so that she was getting what we call welfare in the States, but he's just not having her own income from the restaurant. So I mean, it was a great impact, I feel. And so I think it's one of the things that we don't often talk about as a communities, but it is important to part of what IFA does. To add to that, uh, Rebecca, you went there and you saw, I mean, mm -hmm. this beneficiary lives in a very remote area. She doesn't get the basic services such as water and electricity. And we often say in IFA that our projects reach the last mile. And this is a very good example of reaching the last mile for people who are living in very remote areas. Yeah, exactly. So before I go, anybody have any questions for Thudan? If not, I have one more question. <laughs> okay. So um, the project mission obviously is centered on reducing poverty, ensuring security, and promoting equality, particularly in rural areas. Uh, what transformative changes have you seen in these communities? So now we're talking back to communities. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, in general, the project has reached over 15,000 people. Eight. Wow. It has created, this includes the most vulnerable and Syrian refugees, by the way, just to make the point there. Uh, it has created more than 4,700 new jobs. Wow. And yeah, and 40%, 41% of those were, were uh, uh, women. So the impact of, of Rajab is, is very evident. You have uh, communities that are building around the project activities. As I said, one of the main things is the savings and credit groups. And these, they tend to, to uh, um, uh, let me say, increase the social cohesion between the refugees and the host communities because they work together to generate some savings and to give credit and to uh, promote income generating activities. So this gave it a community level impact like you mentioned. Mm. And it also, as I said, enhanced the social cohesion between the refugees and the host communities. Yes. And I think the impact on the women themselves is, um, perhaps I can talk a little bit about that because when I was there and I was talking to them, we asked, well, how, how has, it, has this project changed your life? And Noor, who, I, who is amazing, she is amazing. And she was telling me that the community looks at her differently because she is a woman. And so some now, like in the beginning, everyone was like, oh, you can't do it. You're, you know, you're not, whatever the reasons, the social barriers, et cetera. But now she says, a lot of people are afraid of her because she's so successful. So it's an amazing story to say it's not just, you know, it affects them in different parts of their lives as well. So thank you, so, Thudan, for so much for all the information you gave us on the Jordan Project. Oh, question, yes. No, uh, it's a it's a grant. So basically, we are partnering with the um, NGO, local NGO called Jordan River Foundation. So they get these women together. They explain to them how to form the so uh, you know the savings and credit groups. They, they form the savings and credit groups. Then they become eligible for competitive grants. So they submit project proposal. If the project proposal is financially feasible and can be sustained, then they get a grant, either individually or a group grant. Now, the group grants usually are for, you know, brothers and sisters, cousins who are sharing the same land, you know? So they get this grant to start their business or to start cultivating and whether it's going to be food processing or just simply selling stories. I hope I answered the question. So thank you. Um, good questions. Um, and I think if you have more questions, obviously afterwards you can ask as well. Um, and then now it's time to hand over to Chef Pierre, share his incredible journey and experiences with the Recipes for Change program. Just a kind, of, just a slight um, background on the Recipes for Change um, celebrity chefs. They highlight the climate crisis impact on rural communities and shares IFA's innovative solutions. Through this, we promote sustainable consumption, smarter cooking, and reducing poverty. So I just want to ask Pierre, what inspired you to become part of the initiative? What inspired me? I mean, for me, it was a no-brainer. I'm from Senegal, so I'm from a region that's very much affected by climate change. Sahel region, south of the Sahara. You know, we are being uh, under the you know the fast advance of the Sahara Desert, and being from Senegal and a chef in the US, I also realized that our products, our most underutilized products that are growing in that region that are climate smart, drought resistant, 
don't have access to market. So as a chef from Senegal being based there, so there was an opportunity. There was a way, it had to be a way to bring these crops to a bigger market, a, vast, a wider market, so that bring economic opportunity to those regions, but also have an impact on the environment because of the fact that these crops are drought resistant. So my mission was aligned with what IFAD was doing, so it was a no brainer. Oh, that's amazing. So can I ask you another question? This is off the books. Did you know about IFAD before you, we approached you? <laughs> okay, so I always say that IFAD is UN's biggest secret because we do amazing work, but sometimes it's on the, on, the, it's on the level of everyday people, we're not as well known. So I understand we have a lot of good investors as well who like who didn't know us, but they now they love us and they are such proponents of promoting IFAD and the work that we do, so. Absolutely, I, I think IFAD deserves to be better known. I mean, this is, to me, it's like the, the work needs to be done. I mean, you mentioned community at the times. And for us, the motto is community is the daily role. If you start thinking with the community approach without uh, that arrogance of bringing answers to the community, but really thinking about the community as having the answers, looking at their indigenous crops that are resistant, that are culturally relevant, mm -hmm. And using them as a path to development, I think that's what IFAD is doing, and that's the way forward. And especially when we talk about climate change and situations like um, food security, you know, we shouldn't be depending on crops coming from mm. miles away. We should be able to use our own crops. We should be able to, particularly when it comes to Africa, there is no way Africa should be. Uh, net food importer. I mean, we are the continent that has close to 65% of the world's arable land. There are hundreds of climate smart and crops that are growing in Africa. And when there's a crisis anywhere in the world, Africa is the first to suffer from famine. This is just makes no sense at all. Mm. There's a war in Ukraine and Africa is starving for, for wheat. And need we need to be able to use our own crops and, 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 and supply and get for it and feed the world. Yes. We have 65% of the world's arable land. We should be able to feed the world if we the food system that, that is sustainable. Thank you. I, and then um, it's just, we're go, just going, coming back to the Recipes for Change uh, program. And how have you been collaborating with it? And how do you think it contributed to tackle or to discuss climate crisis, promote sustainable practices? I think you discussed a little bit about that. Well, I, I've traveled to some new projects in Senegal and in Chad and uh, meeting with women. So that's very important as well. To, to, to know that if you want to improve the community, working with women is, is the way to, to do it. And both in Senegal and Chad, I was just amazed by their resiliency and their, their and really, I mean, truly that's, they were the reason why these crops were still alive because they were doing the hard work, uh, making it the processing. I mean, everything was manual. And the, the, the way IFAD is supporting them is really to equip them and, and train them in better agricultural practices and bring the uh, type of research that makes zone crops being faster maturing. So all those different ways of supporting these communities is what I've observed when I was in, in uh, Senegal and in Chad. And, and I thought this was this is the kind of support that's needed. Thank you. I think we have a video of you when you visited Chad, so I thought we would show everyone. He's known as Africa's culinary ambassador. Based in New York, Senegalese chef Pierre Tam is an international advocate for West African cuisine. <laughs> But here in the semi-arid Sahel region of Chad, he realized he has a lot to learn about cooking with sesame, key ingredient of the dishes here. It's good. It's a good taste. It's a good taste. It's a good Chadian farmer Fatima Saleh is teaching Pierre how to cook the traditional dish smoked fish with sesame and sorrel sauce. 
Although this is a dish that has been cooked regularly in Fatima's family, the key ingredient sesame is now under threat. In fact, sesame production is a crucial activity for many women farmers who depend on it for their livelihoods. But short and late rainy seasons are decimating harvests across the country. Now in this community, a project supported by the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or EFAD, through its Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture program, is helping farmers to find a solution. These fast maturing seeds that can be harvested despite the short rainy season are the farmer field schools, where Fatima and others learn about crop rotation, organic farming and how to analyze weather information, which helps them adapt to the changing climate. Right. They then implement these techniques in their own fields. Et donc c'est une c'est une culture qui est très importante traditionnellement ici, mais maintenant avec ces méthodes qui permettent de 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 de, de mitiger vraiment le changement climatique, ça change tout là, ça 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 renforce la sécurité alimentaire de de, de cette zone quoi, et c'est il y a pas de prix pour ça. Back in the kitchen, the chefs have the ingredients they need to get to work. <inaudible> The sesame is cooked and then ground into a paste and mixed with the other ingredients to make a sauce. This is served with sorghum balls, a type of bread made of sorghum flour. Sugar is added to the sesame paste for dessert. Interesting, c'est qu'avec un ingrédient comme le sésame, on peut faire tellement de produits dérivés. Elle fait de, elle se fait de l'argent en faisant de l'huile, elle peut vendre marché, mais elle fait différents plats des snacks. Fatima and almost 4,000 other farmers can now continue to earn money from their sesame production using farming techniques that are more resilient to climate change. They can also continue to prepare and share their traditional meals. Manger en Afrique en, en famille autour du bol, c'est vraiment l'espérimental. Et honnêtement, le plus, le plus est meilleur. Mm. 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 So I know it's about lunch times. So that makes me kind of hungry, personally. <laughs> okay, so I think um, I have just one question for you, Perry, if I could. In what ways do you believe your experience in Chad, as we saw, has influenced your approach in promoting sustainable cooking? Oh, uh, this experience really uh, not only convinced me that the way forward is in the past, really, because these traditional, these methods of agriculture are their tradition, really. I mean, tradition, when you talk about multi cropping, the way agriculture needs to be, this is the way these African farmers have been practicing agriculture for hundreds of years. And somehow, along the way, we lost that path. We forgot that agriculture is culture. You know, agriculture is, I mean, those communities have to be involved in it. And it became now a, a, an industry that was about monoculture just for the benefit of stakeholders. You know, this is really that something studied with plantations, that studied with colonization, that studied with this mode of life when we saw that profits could be made regardless of the season. These people grow with the season, they have to follow the, that was that's rain fed agriculture. But it became something of like uh, really just profits, but not the type of profits that has an impact. It's about the profits just for the, 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 the operations. And that's fortunately 
this is not agriculture. Yeah. And that's what I've learned from from uh, going back to these projects, these communities. I've learned that this time to really rethink, and they, there's so much to learn from these. They have that knowledge, mm. and we all need to use the, 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 the support will make them really continue to grow the way it's been going, happening mm. for hundreds of years in the past. So. so I think this can, your response kind of goes on to my next question is that we're going to talk a little bit about your um, your your experience your sorry your business um how does your culinary expertise and your lele foods align with ifa's vision for sustainable culinary ventures does it align absolutely absolutely at my restaurants my menus are inspired by not only the tradition of west african cuisine but i try to also bring ingredients when i source them in ingredients that are underutilized so if you come to teranga you would have fonio, broth fonio on the menu you would have a type of rice that's grown by small farmers in Liberia. It's a red rice. It's a Riza Glaberima type of rice that is also disappearing. And unfortunately, in Africa, you would see most of the rice that's consumed, and salad rice that's consumed, is coming from Southeast Asia. But we have our family of rice that's been as ancient as the Asian rice, but there's no supply chain for it. So that's what I try to do. Promote the restaurant, these kind of products. You know, we also have fermented cassava couscous. So all of these are like the 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 way for us to to support this movement. My company Yolele, which is a, a brand, a CPG company, we distribute across the United States in supermarkets like Whole Foods and Target. And we have our star ingredient is fonio. Fonio is an ancient grain, believed to be the oldest cultivated grain in Africa. And within five years, Yolil has been able to introduce it to We have over 3,000 supermarkets. We have a strong online presence. We have different variations of Fonio products. Just because we had the intention, and it turns out the market is there for it, the, 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 especially when you look at the, the younger generation, the, the millennials, the Gen Zs, they are the conscious consumers who are looking to also make sure what they consume only is good for them, but it's good for the planet. So that's how Lele was able to introduce Fonio, Fonio grains, Fonio pilafs, and even innovating by bringing Fonio chips in the market. And I'll tell you about it together, Fonio beer that we've been collaborating with uh, in Peru, and it's been quite uh, successful. Hmm. Well, thank you. I'm, so, I'm really surprised that it's really Gen, Gen Z, as you mentioned, that is really uh, looking to these uh, new... Are you? I'm not Gen Z, obviously, but are you surprised? I am. Why? I, for some reason, I thought it would be, you know, thinking like, I don't know, I was thinking of the '60s with the peace, love. People would be a little bit more conscious about where food came from. But I'm surprised. Like, the, younger generation. the '60s. I mean, they're the one who are consuming corn yeah. and wheat and soy and and, and steaks. The one percent. No, the 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 Gen Zs are the ones who not only they are also very adventurous as. Just manifesto can tell you. I mean, because of this interest for food and and and, and that's part of the culture now. So they want to they want to explore. Yeah, they have their the foodies, yeah. but they also they they're mindful. They also know that most of the chronic diseases that we're dealing with are connected with our limited diet. So just for those reasons and the fact that they put their money where it has an impact makes them the perfect perfect consumers. That's amazing. Yeah, I learned something new. So thank you, Chef Pierre, for uh, sharing your insights and your experience. It truly, it truly is inspiring to see how you're contributing to a meaningful change, not just in the kitchen, but in the lives of people around the world. Um, you can find more information about Recipe for Change. We have th these boxes, which has recipes from all around the world, all the projects that we've been working on. You can take one with you. There's a URL on the back so if you want to find more information about our program. But please stay because um, Chef Pierre is going to do a session now on lost crops, which is really fascinating. So stay and listen to him talk. He has new panelists. So we're going to show you a quick video before just for the transition. So stay. Oh, and we have chips too. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
So. Okay. Shall we start? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we we'll, gi we'll give it the time of the. We have a, uh, a movie, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, half of the people on these slides are not in this panel and are replaced by another half. So I'm not Chris Mitchell, who is supposed to moderate. I'm actually working with Chris. I'm Patrick Dupont. I'm a head of BCG Africa and. Some logistics problems have, uh, you know, I've been asking the. We got the boss. In ten in ten minutes to uh, replace uh, Chris, who will be fired tomorrow for that. I'm just kidding. Um, but actually, this is a topic that is very dear to my heart. Actually, we we had coffee this morning with Remy and and uh, Pierre, and I had no idea that I would moderate their panel. So that's even better. Um, so let me introduce the the, the panelists. Um, I think everyone knows Pierre. He's a big star. Uh, and um, he's 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 a uh, he's a uh, you know the, the the star of our panel today. We have Remy from Sahel. We have Dana from Ifad, and we have who basically? Because I'm <laughs> you are okay. Uh, first manifesto, Honcho, big man. Okay, and uh, so yeah, the United Nations. Okay, so we'll start with a, a short movie on the, what Pierre has been uh, developing. I think it's, uh, and you have some some real real life test experience of new uh, chips for new chips. So maybe maybe focus on the movie and the chips uh, after while we are talking. It will be you will feel like being in the cinema. My name is Garrett Oliver, and like many of us, I am a great many things. On most days, though, I carry with me an almost magical title, Brewmaster. Using little more than grain, water, and some flowers, I use flavor to conjure up some of life's richest treasures, history, community, laughter, and even connection to our ancestors. Today, our planet is in danger, but Africa holds some powerful solutions. So let me tell you a small tale of a chef, a brewer, and an ancient grain called Bonium. I'm heading to Luby Doo, the star, a calm, leafy oasis, and Dakar's relentless buzz. I'm meeting my friend Pierre Chim, the Senegalese chef, who's working tirelessly to bring Fonio to the world stage. I've never been here, and yet, strangely, I'm home. You went finally. It's finally Fonio time. It's an odd thing when a dream comes true. I once told Pierre, and I meant it, that my real goal in this Fonio project was to end up in Senegal with Pierre as my friend and almost spiritual guide. I only know what I've been doing with Fonio. Pierre's going to show me the important part. Africans here on the ground doing with Fonio, and it's a whole new thing. And as soon as I heard about it, I'm like, they they must be making beer from this because beer is from Africa, yeah. right? North to south, yeah. east to west, thousands of years, and any grain that there was from sorghum to wheat varieties, etc., they always made beer. And it turns out it makes very good beer. It does actually. The expert here, as a brewer, of course, I'm thinking about beer here. Like the grains used for brewing, Fonio is primarily food. And some great food it is. In five minutes, it hooks up nice and fluffy with a luring, nutty, fruity aroma. It's a great foil for stronger flavors like this lamb shank and the citrus-based yasa seasoning. And it's a terrific vehicle for sauces. So, Fonio, a miracle grain. Yes, but... Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go, but yeah, you're right. It's always right. There's a but, but, but. The but is in the processing. There's a skin. You see this fonio? This fonio grains? It's like sand. It looks like sand, right? So imagine each grain of sand is covered with a skin that needs to be removed. 
and traditionally it's done with a mortar and pestle. So you have women pounding two for two hours just to have one kilo of pony already. So that's like oh man, tedious. Uh, no, like, no, nah, man. I'm from Brooklyn. We don't have time. <laughs> No pounding for two hours. I need something I can cook in like 15, 20 minutes. Well, I can show you where it's being done right now. In Ola, I can take you to women who are still pounding for you. The old way. What we're having here right now. So yeah, the old way. Oh, let's go. To see the origins of phonio processing, we have to burrow out of the chaos of Dakar out into the deep countryside. As we arrive, it's 106 degrees Fahrenheit, 41 Celsius. I haven't even started to work yet. And already, even my hat is starting to melt. Assalamu alaikum. 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 Donc là, ils sont en train de faire ce qu'on appelle du décortiquage. Wow, that's the decorating out this cloud. Yes, yeah, so that is a lot of work. Can I see it? Oh, I'll try here for a second. I think I'm not doing this nearly as hard as I are. You know, you're not used to it. It's an awful, man. This thing is heavy. It is heavy. Women tend to give up this kind of practice. It's so fine. It's so fine, but you see, you have a lot of dust. You gave this up. I'm going to give it up right now. So you see, that's why. Strong though. So now we use machine to do this process. It's so very, right. very hard. Yeah. All right. So this, this still has this still has sand. Right? Uh huh. So yeah. It looks like sand. Like, how can you even separate this out? So you're going to see, girls are going to show you how they're going to do to separate <laughs> the phonium. Setting the stalks. Hours and hours of pounding by hand to separate the grain and remove the hull. Launching over and over again to remove the sand. Calabashes aren't an affectation. Rough inner surface holds the sand in place so that the phonio can slip free. To say that it's hard work is an understatement. They've been doing it this way for millennia. Phonia has always been reliable. There was a cost. Now, for the first time, there's a new way to do all of this. This machine, installed by Yolele West Africa, does all this work hundreds of times faster and using a tiny fraction of the water. The growers can spend their time growing and adding value. And now, after 5,000 years, Fonio is ready for the world stage. I've been working with phonio. Like I've been using all this phonio, and I'm like just using it up, using it up, using. It. I had no idea. I heard about the pounding, and I heard about the sit thing, but when you're actually doing it. It's like that's a hard work. So I'm glad you're not doing it anymore. And we because now we understand how difficult it is and why we are having the phonio pattern. Because to produce enough phonio to satisfy customers like you, a lot of quantities and panning and manual washing, they won't do it. Wow. They won't. And actually, it's hard to have such a cost. It's a quality that's satisfying. So, well, you increase the increase the food to have people, a lot of people have food in the food. So it's really good. And you can't have sand in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's all about making it market, right? At the end of the day, you need to make the product attractive. The domestic market, because there is a sense where you're talking about local product, people will be 
we're working on making this local product really, really high in quality, by like bringing state of our manufacturing process in quality. At the same time, this product is great. It's gluten free, it's protein. This is like the trend in the global market. So, I want to also make sure that the talent is getting to the global market, but exporting it and working with partners to export it. That's where we are now. Thank you. Well, everybody wants it, man. Yeah. And you, you have a good point, Abdurrahman, when you say the product is trending. It really checks all the boxes. It's, it's gluten free. It's very nutritious. It's great for the environment. And you know, I knew this moment was going to come when we started that challenge of taking Fonio into the global market. We started in the United States. No one knew what Fonio was there, but we had a consumer segment, the Gen Zs and the millennials looking for products of that standard, you know, products that were good for them and good for the planet. And that's them who were like put us to the point where we were just one supermarket. Five years ago today being distributed across the US and the demand is growing. But to satisfy that demand, we had to come to build a meal, figure out a meal that would really have the standards for global markets for big food, for big industry. And we needed for that have of stations like my man here, right? Dream with me here for a moment. What if we were able to design a perfect brain that would bring great benefits to the planet and to the people who live on it? What properties might that grain possess? It would grow quickly and easily, even in poor soils. It would grow without any need for chemical fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, or insecticides. It would barely need any water. It would fix the soil and maybe even reverse the spread of deserts. It would grow two full crops every year. Our miracle grain would be highly nutritious. It would have a low glycemic index. It would be packed with antioxidants and it would be naturally gluten free. It would cook up quickly and easily. It would make delicious food and even delicious beer. It would support smallhold farmers in developing parts of the world, building strong, self-sufficient communities. It turns out, of course, that we don't have to design this grain. Funnel has been waiting right here for all of us in Africa for 5,000 years. Fortunately, the Earth has always had its own wisdom. All we have to do is listen. So I hope you enjoyed the the film. Um, I think we should take out that because none of us are here in the in this picture. So um, so maybe Pierre in a, in a in a minute. What, 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 why for you? Where does it come from? And what are the benefits? It's on the it's in the film. You know, you say okay, it's for millennial uh, millennials and Gen Z. Is it more than that? Much more than that. Much more than that. It just happened that millennials and Gen Zs are, are like the, the trendsetters. So they, they they made it sexy again. So, and, and that was important. Branding, we realized that it was important to brand it first. And that is to answer your question, why for you? It's not just about for you. And it's very important that it does not remain just about for you. We don't want for you to be the next quinoa. There are hundreds of other crops that are out there that need to be integrated in the food system alongside Fonio. We need to support them because if we just turn Fonio into that world set, the farmers are only going to grow Fonio and, and we don't want that. We want them to keep growing Bambara groundnuts, you know, this amazing bean that's been grown alongside Fonio but is disappearing now. We want them to bring back, you know, sorghum, all those other millets. And there are many other beans that are there in the market. So yes, it's important that we do that to answer your question. Thank you. So what are you talk about the environmental benefits? Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, you want to uh, comment on that. What is the why are you talking about Fonio COP28, which is about climate? Remy, Remy. Yeah, I think Remy, who's yes. Uh, for, for okay. Uh, well. Uh, We've been working with farmers for the past 40 years to restore land and uh, to improve farming capacities. But until we don't work on the product, I think uh, we will never resolve the problem. So uh, today we know that uh, we can use so many 
products, as uh, Pierre detailed. But the key question for Fonio, for example, is really to, because we start from scratch again, uh, it's a forgotten crop. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, work with farmers. We started with 120 farmers two years ago, when after some time after we met Pierre, this is how we started the story. And uh, we saw the different practices, what are the agricultural itineraries, and uh, what you saw in the in the film, all the process to get a clean fonio and to give it to the market. Even in Dakar, people don't consume fonio because uh, there is sand inside. And uh, so the key point is really to work on all the stage, all, all the stage of the practices. And uh, actually, for new production is about 600,000 tons per year, mostly in Guinea. And in Senegal, it's really a forgotten crop. It's less than 2,000 uh, hectares per, per year. So uh, there is a huge, a huge work to do, but to add value on the crop and uh, also to make the, to engage the farmers in the process. And so, and so then I have a question to Ifad. So why does it matter to Ifad? Why do you think it's a, it's an important uh, topic? This is a really great question. Um, and hi, my name is Dana Vitell, and I'm Communication Officer for Partnership and Innovation at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And if you don't know our name, EFAD, you know our work. Uh, we work with smallholder farmers. And I think what is really important about the film and the work that um, Pierre is doing is the message of inclusion. Uh, and that we want smallholder farmers to be part of the solution here. Um, EFAD works with farmers, um, and I think um, I would be joined probably by my friend Paul in saying that it's vital that we solve SDGs one and two together. So hunger and poverty going together is also a big part of this. I like the triple win of Fonio. So for me personally, looking at the story of it, there is an economic opportunity and that small scale farmers have access to this opportunity is really important. Um, it's also nutritious, you know, so we're talking about utilizing under underutilized crops and making them part of the food system. And so if I take a step back, I can see how that that actually is really illuminating food systems transformation. And my last point um, is that it's good for the environment, which is why we're also all here at COP today. So critical for small scale farmers is adaptation and resilience. So having access to opportunities can prevent someone from falling back into poverty. And that's something that I think is really vital and really important part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, you want to add on, on that? Yeah, look, um, I think, you know, as we're here at COP, we're looking for accelerated solutions and we want action. And this is a, a great example of action. Um, it's looking back to look forward. Um, so we're looking back at traditional crops which have grown for millennia that have been used as part of driving forward solutions. Why are, th why, why are those crops there? They're easy to grow. They're adapted to the, 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 the space. They maybe use less water. They have nutritional benefits. Um, so we have to kind of identify where are those heroes and I think as Pierre said it's not about one it's about many our problem some many of the problems we have today around human health around environment and the impacts around water and, and the impacts around climate are really because we focused too tightly in our food system on really driving that efficiency driving the price down that accessibility and so what we have to do now is open that up we still need to make it accessible, affordable. We still need to be lacking that, but we need to have that diversity of solutions. And so to do that, we have to go back, look at indigenous, local knowledge, identify those wins, but bring innovation to that. And I think this, you know, classic example of innovation, um, bring branding, bring ways of actually communicating these crops. And chefs are, are the intermediate between the food, the ingredients we eat, and the way we eat. And they set trends and they can cultivate trends. And so Chef Pierre has done that in an amazing way and continuing to do that. And I think what I love is that he could get hooked on Funio and only be Funio, but he's also got this vision of much broader crops, a whole range of different crops, which actually all do the same, but it's also connected to the farmer. And so it's also about smallholder farmers. It's about helping provide livelihoods 
and also provide solutions. And I think this is where sometimes we get all about nature, all about environment. We forget about the people. You know, you get these beautiful photos of, a, a, you know, let's go back to where there was no people. And you're like, what are you talking about? There's people that need livelihoods. And part of the reasons why we have a degraded space is because they're not getting the income. They're not get, being able to have the choices that they need. And so I think to me, this is part of the, the solution. I think one thing you, you said is, is uh, about not being stuck in one ingredient. And that's because of my background in the kitchen. And a chef kind of can explain that too as well. So being focused on one ingredient was never an option. You need a multitude of ingredients. And, and, and that's really, again, the importance of diversity. And diversity is the only solution. At this moment, our food system is limiting us to like a limited number of crops. And in a concentration of not only regions, everything is coming from concentrated regions. And you have these crops, I, I mentioned that earlier, these crops are here available, but we're ignoring them. Not only are they available, they're better for us and better for the planet. That's a good segue to talk about the importance of having everyone involved, because everyone needs to be involved, starting with BCG, IFAD, SOS Sahel with the rural community, the chef, obviously. And I'd like to say that this vision of this uh, festival that I would like to talk about, we, we're having a festival that's coming up because the Lost Crops Festival. It's a project that we've started to think about earlier with BCG and OCP, and then SOS Sahel joined us. Chef's Manifesto is joining us. And that's this event that we will have in Dakar next summer. It's called the Lost Crops Festival, and we want this event to be the starting point for a movement where all the stakeholders will be invited to this festival. Because it's so urgent that we have this conversation and everyone is involved in the conversation. Everyone has a piece of the solution. But once we put down the silos and, and get our heads together on how we not only celebrate these Lost crops and lost crops is a loose term, right? These crops underutilized and, and bring them into our food system in a sustainable way so that the consumers, the communities, the environment, everyone is benefiting from it. And everyone could benefit from it. The corporations, the big food systems, the big food uh, industries, they can benefit from it just like the brewery industry in this example of Fonio. The brewery industry will have new products, they will have an impact because they have a huge a use of those grains. The same, Nestle should be able to use it. Where is Barilla? We, they could be making pasta with Fonio. Where is Kellogg's? Uh, where are all of those guys? We want all of them to be part of this festival to have that conversation. So that's really the reason why I, I was thinking we had to have this, this kind of thinking. No one has a solution, but the solutions are clearly coming from these crops. Thank you. So, so since I was not supposed to be moderating, I will give my opinion as a panelist, which yes. is uh, beyond the rules. We actually think it's very serious. We are not here as BCG. You know, we don't grow for new. We grow slides and analysis. Uh, but actually, our view is this is one of the most promising solutions to uh, a mix of food security, as you said, farmers' um, poverty challenge, uh, resilience to uh, water uh, scarcity, and so climate resilience overall, high yields, because actually you produce high yields, nutritious. Uh, so I think you, you mentioned the triple, triple win. Actually, from our old analytical perspective, this is not small. This is not a gadget. We really believe in it, and that's why we've been partnering with, with Pierre uh, on that, and uh, we will be partnering on the Lost Crop Festival. This is one of these forgotten opportunities of the climate space and the food security uh, challenge. Uh, and we very much believe that it can be actually quite big. So on allow, side. allow me to jump in. Um, I think that was a perfect segue. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, I think just the approach to the Lost Crops Festival and moving beyond partnerships. You know, we talk a lot about partnerships, especially at you know, something like COP28. We you hear the word partnership a lot. But I love what Pierre is doing to really transform that and take action and getting people to the table, uh, metaphorical and <laughs> real table, um, and that it's really an inclusive approach. You know, um, 
it's almost like building a coalition to solve the problem. And I think that's what we really need. We need to bring together the non-traditional players. So look at, I mean, just the representation on this panel is a lot of non-traditional players. You've got advocacy, you've got finance, you've got um, you know, problem-solving consulting groups, you've got a chef, you've got someone working for an international financial institution and specialized United Nations agency. So what do we all have in common is that we want, you know, we want to transform and the solution here. So um, I just, I really appreciate and value the approach. And I know I said it before my earlier comment, but inclusion of small scale farmers is such a vital part of this. So um, absolutely. So maybe to just to, uh, I think we need to wrap up uh, shortly. How big can it be? Like, are we talking about like small stuff? So you actually cook in your New York restaurant or can it really be transformative uh, at, you know, for Africa? Uh, Absolutely. Generally? Absolutely. I mean, for me, there's like, no what we've been able to do with Fonio, Yolel is a small company, right? And uh, we, in five years, we were able to take this one grain in the US market. No one knew about Fonio and we were able to introduce it to have widespread distribution to add new products in the midst of a pandemic. And, and we are distributing, distributing our products in thousands of U.S. supermarkets with also a, a strong online presence as well. And now introducing it to industries like the brewery. We're talking to people in Copenhagen. We were just there to Carlsberg. We, we had a distribution in the U.K. actually. I wish, wish you, maybe you have that, 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 that new beer. There's like a beer, for your beer in the U.K. So... This is just one grain, just one example. Again, we don't want just Ponyo to be that grain. We want it can be big. If we include the small farmers, if we follow this model of like contracting the small farmers, invest in research, because research is important as well. Invest in research on the impact and on how to improve the yield in a sustainable way of these crops. And now brand these crops to like open markets locally and internationally, this can be huge. This is like, to me, this is a solution that we can, we will enjoy so delicious, first of all. And it is a solution that will have triple impact, repeating what you said, the environment, consumers, and, and the, the communities that bring them. I think just one comment just on, on how big this can be and what, what's required. I think we need a very clear strategy. Um, and I think sometimes we talk about this stuff, but then we're not strategic. And I think the reason Funio is, is because he has been very strategic about the way that he's worked that through. It's also about champions. And I think we need to think about the human face of food. And I think sometimes we get very analytical and, and we, we, we have these conversations behind the scenes, but we don't put the personality in front of the food. And I think you need stories and personality. And Pierre's done that very well with Funio. There's many others doing that for different crops. But I, I would say we need five to six or seven of these things going all at once, simultaneously launching every year going forward on different crops, going well, building strategic frames with the right champions to really drive this forward. But And then it can be as we can shift the, the food system very fast. And that's what we have to do. Now, Remy, how many farmers do you train on? Actually, uh, 1,000, but next year it will be 5,000. And uh, with, uh, two, by 2025, it will be 5,000. And we want to make uh, 10,000 in uh, five years. Uh, and I would like to connect it to the Great Green Wall in Initiative in the Sahel, because uh, the aim of the Great Green Wall Initiative is to restore uh, three, uh, no, 100 million uh, of uh, hectares of land in the Sahel region, which can be available for crops like Fonio, Teff, and uh, cowpea, and all these products. Uh, it's not only planting trees, in agroforestry system, which is very important, and the baobab uh, leaf can bring uh, can be a good source for the fonio recipe. Uh, but at the same time, we do more and smart farming agriculture adapted to the climate change. You mentioned deaf fonio. Can you just name five, six of so these? millet, bambara groundnuts. I can keep going, okay. but you know what he said is important. You know that great green world that. And people don't even believe in anymore. That great green world can happen if we think of it in this approach, which is bringing 
the products, the crops, the plants, the indigenous ones that grow naturally in the region that are resilient and figuring out a way to add value to these products from these crops, from these plants, from these trees and open markets for them. The communities will be now motivated to grow more for you. They will be motivated to, to grow more share nuts, to grow more acacia because and acacia is like the kind of trees traditionally they would plant them in the region around fonio fields because it improves the yield by five times without any fertilizers you know so it's chemical fertilizers by that so that's the kind of thing there is a market for acacia already the SOS soil has helped develop that so the arabic gum there is a market for baobab because baobab the fruit is amazing it has an amazing amount of vitamin c the leaves are already used in the culinary world there's a market for a bunch of other stuff that can be grown in that great green world region and great green world can be built this way by bringing economic opportunities for the crops and plants from that region Thank you. So I think we are on time. Looking back to look forward, I like it. Can I borrow that quote in the future? I, I, I love it. So, so really looking back to look forward. It's innovation, but looking back, uh, it's probably the start of something. I am sure that in a few years' time, it will be big, will be significant. You said the triple win uh, for the farmers, for the environment, for food security. Um, so looking forward, there is this festival end of June in Dakar to bring together funders, innovators, research, farmers, organizations to try to really uh, scale it up. And the last one is uh, this evening, there is the launch of the COP28 action agenda. So in the official uh, um, uh, program of the presidency in the Halwaha uh, Blue Zone, there will be more or less all the big uh, you know, food companies present, uh, Unilever, Nestle, uh, and all the likes, some farmers' organizations, the presidencies. It's about regenerative agriculture. So it's how do we actually scale regenerative agriculture? It's, I think you're front and center in this agenda. And I think it is a growing uh, thing that uh, we see is, uh, is increasingly exciting uh, uh, going forward. So thanks for that. And thanks to everyone for attending. And sorry for a slight improvisation of this uh, of this, uh, but it was a great panel, and thank you, Pierre, for uh, leading this. Oh, thank you, thank you, Patrick, thank you, everyone. This is really thank you, Dana. <laughs>